As we, as we come to the close of our four stories about Jesus today, I'm, uh, I'm excited God's going to bring some breakthrough. Uh, I, I, uh, we had a wedding yesterday. Miriam and Jackson got married. <laughs> Beautiful ceremony, a brief, nice and low-key like Miriam wanted it. I made it more unlow-key than she wanted, but that's how it goes sometimes. <laughs> Amen. Jackson's family was in town, nice folks, really nice folks, if you didn't get to meet them. <coughs> um, so that was nice. I think, they're, uh, they, I think they're leaving this morning to go to uh, Mexico, so keep them in prayer, that they won't uh, be one of those stories of folks getting abducted at uh, Mexican uh, resorts, which has been happening, and so just not them, amen? amen. Not them. Amen? amen? Not not them. I heard Chelsea won last night. Is that right, Chelsea won? Who won last night? Liverpool won last night. Is that good or bad? I'm American. I don't know. Is it good or is that bad? Liverpool won last night. I don't even know what that... Is it good? Is, that, is it good or bad? I, does anybody know? I don't know. Is that a race? I don't... It's a big deal to some people, though. So for the for Liverpool fans, that sounds like a bad beer, doesn't it? Liverpool sounds like, you know, I had a 40 of Liverpool and I just... I'm not feeling nothing today, you know? I got some Liverpool. Better see the doctor. Well, congratulations to the fans of whatever that is. Hallelujah. 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 We're in our four stories about Jesus. We're finishing it up. And uh, what, I hope, what I hope you're seeing, and, and hopefully I can drive home today, is that Jesus really wants to get people unstuck. He really wants to get people unstuck stuck like he didn't come like to build something I, I don't I don't like men want to build things that's that's God is not trying to build anything he's trying to get us unstuck from our need to build things like he just wants us to live in fellowship with him and that be enough and we can <laughs> if we can lose the big picture of God wanting us to get unstuck uh, as we as we as we as we stare at the finer details. So if you have a Bible, go ahead and turn to Mark chapter 3. Uh, and we're going to finish up uh, our study today. <clears throat> uh, next week, we're starting a new message series called Spiritual Revival on Pentecost Sunday. And we're just going in until you all get touched. And then we're going to keep going in until you get other people touched. It's got to get through you. Amen? Getting to you is not enough. I feel like we could all clap to that. I've, just you getting touched is not enough. We want everybody around us to get touched. Amen? <coughs> Excuse me, I've got a little cough this morning, and hopefully it's going to go away. So in Mark chapter 3, starting in verse 1, talking about Jesus, said, He entered again into a synagogue. This is not the temple, this is a synagogue. And a man was there whose hand was withered. They were watching him to see if he would heal him on the Sabbath. Remember, there's a trend here of non-followers of Jesus following him around. It's amazing how many non-followers are following him or how many of his followers aren't really following. It's, I don't know however you want to look at it. Uh, they were watching him to see if he would heal on the Sabbath so that they might accuse him. <clears throat> he said to the man with the withered hand, get up and come forward. And he said to them, is it lawful to do good or to do harm on the Sabbath, to save a life or to kill? But they kept silent. After looking around at them with anger, grieved at their hardness of heart, he said to them, stretch out your hand. And he stretched out his hand, and his hand was restored. The Pharisees went out and immediately began conspiring with the Herodians against him as to how they might destroy him. Now, we had seen the Pharisees and the Sadducees come against Jesus, and for the first time, we see a new group of people called the Herodians, and Let's pray. Father, I just thank you that you're going to move today and as we conclude this message series that you're going to erupt something in our hearts that we're going to see what it is you're trying to do in our day and hour, Father, and help us understand how we are to become a part of it. And Father, I pray that people today will get unstuck. Unstuck from the, the walls and the rooms that they themselves built. That they get unstuck from the patterns of behavior and the lifestyles and the uh, sin nature, 
and uh, just the hard-heartedness and stubbornness that keeps us from really entering into your best, Father. And we pray that people get unstuck and released into your glorious presence. In Jesus' name, everybody said? Amen. 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 <coughs> so as we study the scriptures, <clears throat> it's important that there's two narratives going on at the same time. There are all these small stories regarding Jesus, regarding David, regarding the temple, regarding uh, Jonah, regarding all these things that are happening. Uh, there's these small stories, and we can get so focused on these small stories that we lose track of the big story that God is trying to communicate through his written word. God, is, uh, the, 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 God did not assemble the Bible <clears throat> as, a, as, a, as a collection of stories. There is a story that God has been releasing since the beginning of time. And, and, and this big story uh, really is the overarching theme of not only the scriptures, but of God's interaction with man. And it's important to keep the big story in mind as we look at the little stories. And, and as I think about this, I think about a, a marriage, <clears throat> and I think about how a husband and wife can get to a place, or parents and children can get to a place, or even friends can get to a place where we're trying to win a fight at the expense of the relationship. We get so caught up in the small story of what's happening right now, we lose track of the big story, and that is that I want to preserve my marriage. We can get so involved in the moment with our child that we lose track of the bigger story that I'm trying to raise a loving, respectful human being who will interact with other people in a constructive manner. We, we, we can lose track of the big picture. And, and I got a little picture here kind of showing the big picture of what's happening in Scripture, and in Scripture, this is the big story that we're to keep in mind. There was the creation in perfection. Then there was the fall of man through sin. And after the fall, and up through the cross, God was working a story of redemption. All through the law, all through the prophets, all through the psalmists, the poets, the story was always the same. God was doing a work of redemption. When the law came, the Jews didn't feel it as some sort of burden. They felt, this is awesome, we've learned God's ways. And when we learn God's ways, we can then be redeemed in our value. Redemption ultimately was perfected at the cross, and now God is working restoration. Restoration of the kingdom of God to earth. This is what our role is. We have a part to play in this restoration. We need to understand our redemption and that Christ is constantly working redemption and that we are to bring restoration of the kingdom of God to earth. Does that, ma does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. And, and when you don't keep this in mind, all of a sudden you forget about the big story to drill down on the little story at expense of what God is trying to do on the earth. Everything Christ is doing right now is redemptive in nature and restorative in its end goal. Does that make sense? <clears throat> As an aside, and this isn't part of a message, this is just for you, I guess. I have debates with people about the role of women in society, the role of women uh, in marriage, and the role of women in the church. And I, I, um, <clears throat> I have found that men with strong personalities have a certain theological bent towards what women are allowed to do. Yeah. It's funny, it's not, a, it's not a theological foundation they come from, but a personality-based. And, uh, and they say things like, well, when, when, when a husband and wife disagree, who's the person who should make the final decision? And I'm like, well, we're having the wrong conversation here because the goal is agreement. The goal is not who gets the boss, who around. The goal is, come on, the goal is, amen, the, the goal is agreement. The goal is oneness. In the garden, we were one. At marriage, we we're one. And we can't invent a theology of dominance because we don't know how to work out an argument. Do you understand what I'm saying? And in everything Christ is doing is redemptive in nature and restorative in its end goal. This is what Christ is doing on the earth. Uh, this is why we don't need some sort of Christian Sharia law. It's not our goal to dominate the non-believers, but to serve and love them, to draw the value out of them. This is what Christ did when he came to earth, the one who actually was the only one anointed to judge, chose to bless. <laughs> and so we, uh, this is our role in the earth. 
And we have to keep that in mind because it's so easy to focus on our own kingdom building. And, and, and I don't say that with judgment. I'm just saying it's hard to get by at times. Life is difficult. This, this life isn't easy. And the forces of this world don't want you to succeed. But the kingdom of heaven does. And, and keeping a kingdom perspective in the midst of trying to keep your marriage together, to keep your family together, to pay the bills each week, just to just do what God has called you to do, can cause us to go back into uh, just systems that God never intended. And then we fall back on our own uh, uh, a plan of what we have come up with instead of what God's ultimate plan was. We talked about this last week, and Jesus said it to the Pharisees in uh, Mark 7. Remember, he said, uh, you are experts at setting aside the commandment of God in order to keep your tradition. And so the commandments of God were God trying to release his redemptive nature and his restorative goals on the earth. And people came up with their own way of doing that, and so they had their oral tradition, and it kept them from coming into God's best. Now, just by way of just the kind of recap and remembrance, the oral tradition turned the, the four laws of the Sabbath into 39 laws of the Sabbath, if you remember. And God's desire is to partner with man to restore and redeem the earth. This is his goal. And, and, and again, I guess I'm on a bit of a soapbox this morning. We have a burning room, we have a prayer room, and we've really tried to pray through what's the point of our burning room. And uh, there's a prayer movement all over the earth today, and, um, and, and we're, we're partners with it. We love it. If you're praying to uh, the living God, we're on the same team. But we don't come together in this room uh, to ask God to come to earth because he's actually living inside us already. Now, if every morning your spouse says, hey, are you going to love me today? At some point, you start getting a little nervous. At some point, you start wondering, if you have to keep asking me, is this settled in your mind? Like, like is, is our partnership, I mean, is, is it, are we not on good grounds or are we on, is this marriage in trouble or is it not in trouble? And if we keep asking God to come like he's not already here, at some point it will affect our theology and our relationship with the Father. Instead of walking around knowing the God of heaven lives on the inside of me, he has redeemed my value to the earth and it is my goal to release this God who's in me to restore the kingdom of heaven on earth. All of a sudden, it moves from that to, I'm here alone. I hope God comes and rescues me. And we need a prayer model that says, God is already here. We're going to worship him, enjoy him, and release him to the earth. As opposed to, I hope he comes today. Of course he came. We're here. It's not possible for us to come here without him, if you're a believer, right? And so we see throughout the scriptures, Jesus is trying to break a broken model that people don't see is broken. Jesus, in our story, he's in the synagogue and, 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 and his accusers are there looking at him. And, and I need you to picture this. He's in the synagogue. And all these people have agreed on the rules. They all agree on the rules. They all agree on the rules, except Jesus didn't agree on the rules. Like He's like, I didn't, I didn't buy into this system at all. I'm doing my own thing. And so here's Jesus, who is a rabbi. They consider a rabbi. Uh, he shows up, and they're like, oh, here's the rule breaker. Like, but the problem is he's not, you know, you know, there's people who always have like an argument against the status quo, but they don't have a better plan. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, those people should shut up. Like, go. Amen. Get, like, 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 I have a rule here at, at the office. You can't, you can't point out a problem unless you have a solution. At least one, you got to have a, one, at least one solution for it. Got to have at least one solution for the problem. Don't just tell me problems. Anybody can point out problems. Come up with some solutions. And so there's people who have always trying to come against what the law is. Uh, but Jesus actually, they got a problem with him because he, he had a better idea. He, he wasn't just coming against the rules. He actually had a better idea. Let's not just say do nothing on the Sabbath. Let's actually do good. But they're like, well, wait a minute, that's not the rule. That's not the rule. And so Jesus, to kind of prove his point, and uh, Jesus was never scared of anybody. Has that ever occurred to you as you're reading the Bible? Like, yeah. this man operated in no fear. Yeah. No fear. Like, they were killing people for breaking the law. And he wasn't doing it off back on the other side of the mountain. He's in the synagogue. He's in the synagogue. 
And he sees a man with a withered hand, and he knows they're looking at him to see if he's going to break the law or not. And he don't just like slide to the side and lay hands on this dude. He calls him to the center. And so now the dude with the withered hand is standing in the center looking at him, right? And everybody's looking at Jesus. And Jesus says, in Mark 3, he says, Is it lawful to do good or to do harm on the Sabbath, to save a life or to kill? Now, that sounds like an easy question to answer right now. To me, that sounds easy to answer. But they kept silent. What, what's, 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 what's going on here? Well, you see, you see, Jesus is like, do we just allow evil to happen? Or do we do something about it? Do we do, we, do, we do something about it? Do we stop evil... Or do we let it happen on the Sabbath? Right? Here's what Jesus is saying. Evil is always at work. And so should the church. Evil is always at work. And Jesus is like, listen, is it lawful for evil to happen on the Sabbath? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's okay. Oh, it's okay for evil to be happening. It's okay for the enemy to be working. It's okay for starvation and poverty and sickness and your animal to fall. And that, oh, that's okay, but it's not okay to fix any of these problems on the Sabbath? Jesus like, that don't make any kind of sense. Then in front of everybody, he healed the guy. They had no answer. Is it lawful to, is it lawful to do evil? No. Then is it lawful to do good? Because do you understand the, 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 how he trapped them? Because they had already come into agreement that we've allowed the enemy a certain amount of authority. And we've limited our authority. Jesus is like, I'm not playing by those rules. If if evil gets to work, I get to work. Does this make sense? If evil gets to work, I get to work. And so he healed the guy. And this, this is a turning point in the Gospels. This is where things get really messy. Again, Jesus is not hiding from people, right? He's, 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 he's not scared of them. The, the, the story goes on in verse 6. It says, the Pharisees went out and immediately began conspiring with, here's the first time we see these people, the Herodians against him as to how they might destroy him. Luke and Matthew also tell this same story. And in, and in Luke's telling, he says that the leaders were filled with rage, they were filled with rage. And I, and I need you to see what's happening now. Uh, uh, evil, the, 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 the demonic one, the, the, the hellish one, the, the devil, evil itself is, is causing the political sellouts to conspire with the religious sellouts. This is what's happening right now. People are so filled with judgment and filled with rage that the Jews chose to partner with the religious people who, who, who the Herodians were Jews who, re, who were happy that Herod was in charge, who was considered a god among the people. They were happy because it gave them power. And they were more than happy to allow not the kingdom of Israel to be restored, but Herod to be the, the head. And so these Herodians, these Herodians, the, 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 the Pharisees, the religious people, found a partner with them. Power loves power. And power loves power more than submission. And Jesus is like, yeah, I, I hate to tell you all, but I've called you to be humble and submit. I've called you to be a blessing and not be in charge. And this, people didn't like this because it threatened them. But here's what's really happening, and this is how it applies to our life. What was Jesus really doing? Jesus is messing with their idols. This is what he was really doing. He was messing with their idols. He was messing with the things that made them feel safe outside of God. This this sounds like something that only happened in Jesus' day, but... (coughs) Early in my walk, um, I I started uh, hanging out with some kind of wild and crazy Christians. And uh, we were in a, um, like I would tell it, a mildly charismatic church. And we just started a little deliverance and healing ministry. And we started seeing people get healed everywhere. We just saw miracles. Now, were we balanced? No. Were we out of balance? Absolutely. Were, Were we a little overzealous? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Right? Like, do we operate in a lot of wisdom? No. No. However, people were getting healed. Cancers were being healed. Deafness was being healed. We'd like, we would like, we would, we would see arches popping feet like popcorn. Like, it would just happen so easy. We'd see legs grow out 
all the time. We saw people get delivered of addiction and disease all, everywhere we went. We would be in the Pizza Hut, back in the kitchen, casting the devil out of the cooking staff. They'd be laid out in the, in the I mean, like, this is what we would do. Like, this is it. This is what we did. And um, so people uh, started calling the church, uh, asking when the healing meetings were happening. But we would just have them in my friend's living room. We would just have, we just, wherever we were, like, hey, now we're having a healing meeting, right? And so people would get healed. And, uh, and, and people were like, hey, we have sick children. We'd like them to be healed. When is the healing meeting? And the staff of the church felt threatened. They didn't like it because this was out of order. This was out of order because it wasn't led by somebody on staff at the church. So clearly it could not be God. So clearly it wasn't God. And so they had a big meeting with us and them and told us we needed to stop because it went against their plan. And I, I, I was completely dumbfounded when this happened. I mean, I just, I could not wrap my, my brain around how people would not want people to be healed. Like, I don't care who gets the credit. If someone gets healed, I, 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 I don't care who gets the credit. I mean, because the credit ultimately goes to Jesus. And so if you're worried about who's getting the credit, then we're focused possibly on the wrong God, right? Yeah. We, we, we might be liking Herod a little too much, right? We, we might be liking the Pharisees and the Sanhedrin a little too much instead of wanting Jesus. And, and so I, I was completely puzzled. Now, you know, my group of friends, um, because we weren't balanced and some were slightly more rebellious than others, you know, we kind of fell apart at some point. Uh, Oh, but I've never forgotten that lesson. I've never forgotten that lesson. And in this church, we want, like, when leaders come here and they start coming to this church, it, here's what always happens. They come to me and they say, listen, listen, pastor, I want you to know, I'm not trying to start my own thing. I'm not trying to, I'm like, hey, we're not threatened by you. We're not threatened by the gift of God in you. We're, we're not, like, we, we are not, like, we want whatever Christ, we wa I mean, we want you to, we want it to fit in healthy. We don't want you to be prophesying death over people or telling people that they need to leave their pastor and, you know, start with you in your living room. Like, that's, you know, that, that's not healthy, right? But, but we, we want your gift. Like, we're not threatened by you being amazing. We hope that you're amazing. We want the amazing in you to come out. We want people to be helped. I mean, if you're a counselor, we, yes. Well, how can we help you counsel? You, you, you minister in the prison? What do you need? Money? People? What do you need? Let, let us help. Like, what, what do you do? Do you witness on the streets? Come on, man. We're with you. Let, let us know so we can be praying for you. Like, like this, is, this is who we are. This is the kingdom. We want to see the restoration of heaven on earth. But that is not the religious mindset. And this is, this is the idolatry of control. And, and, and in our story, the idolatry of control of the Pharisees with their man-made rules, like they had turned it into an idol. And their idolatry of power caused them to conspire with people who didn't even want Israel to be restored. And, and their conspiracy with Rome to keep Jesus from being king. This is what idolatry did. Their idolatry caused them to conspire with Rome to keep the Messiah from being king. This is the little story. This is the little story that we're studying right now. And, 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 and we move from this little story of Jesus healing a man in his hand to the big story. And again, when you read the Bible, you've got to keep the big story in mind. We have to be studying the big story. And so we move from this story about a simple healing to the bigger story of things that Jesus was getting at. Here's the real danger for Christians, and I want you to get this. Put it up if you would, please. Timothy Keller said this. He said, The great danger is not that we become atheists as believers, but that we ask God to coexist with the idols in our hearts. That is the danger. Like, we're not, I mean, I'm not, I'm not going to deny Jesus and start worshiping Orion, right? Like, that's not going to happen. I'm not going to become Muslim, right? Like, I'm not going to deny Jesus and become a Jew. That, that, that's not... That's not really a danger. I'm not just going to become an atheist and say that I haven't seen and experienced everything I've seen and experienced. Probably you're the same. That, that's, that's not a danger. What is a danger is that you will ask God to coexist with your idols. That's the danger. And I don't know what the idols are in your heart, be it comfort, be it finances, be it a spouse. I mean, I don't, I don't know what the idols of your heart control. I don't, I don't know. 
I don't know what the idols of your heart, but Jesus is not really looking to cohabitate, right? He's not trying to co-rule. But the only answer to this is not more rules. This is, this is absolutely what I need you to hear. If you struggle in your heart to follow Jesus wholeheartedly, you might think what you need is more willpower, and what you need is to be more determined. And what you need is just more outside influence or you need to... Re- no, no, let me tell you what we need. We need spiritual revival. This is the only thing that will do it. We need a revival of the Spirit. That, that is what does it. It's not like man-made things are ruling my life. I need to get more man-made things to, to, to counterbalance them. No, 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 no. That's not... That's, that's religion. We don't need more religion to counter religion. We don't need religion to counter sin. We don't need religion to counter people coming against God. What we need is spiritual revival. This is what we need. We need spiritual revival. This is what idolatry is against. These people had an idol in their heart, and they were rejecting the man who would set God as the king because of their rules. This is why, hear me, we have to be people of the Spirit, not people of man-made religion. Religion creates idols. That's not the way we do it around here. That's not the way we do it around here. Image, excuse me, an idol is, is um, it's an image that represents a false god. And so many of us, like, that false god is safety. It's security. It's not worrying. It's things are going to turn out the way I thought or wanted them to turn out. And following Jesus, I don't know if you know this, you don't know where that's going. We don't know where that's going, except heaven. And if you have some other destination in mind, you have an idol. Do you hear what I'm saying? Have you noticed that Jesus would perform great miracles in crowds and then disappear? Did you notice that? Did you notice like, uh, that like time and again he wouldn't allow them to uh, anoint him as king? Did, have you noticed that in the scriptures? We read in, in Luke and Matthew, like I said, in the same story that after he healed this man and he left the synagogue, the masses were following him. And he healed them all. And in one guy, uh, the devil, the, the demons manifested, and he told the demons, don't tell people who I am. He kept telling them not to tell anybody. Why? Let's ask this question. Why did Jesus say not to tell people about what he did? Now, there's a lot of theories. Some say, like, because it wasn't his time to become king. I thought he was always king. It's not like he became king. He always was king, right? So it, it wasn't that. It's not like he matured in the kingship. Like, he's God. He didn't get a promotion. At the, you know what I mean? He's, he's God. He already was the king of kings and lord of lords, right? Had nothing to do with time. He, he, here, here's the problem. This is why Jesus kept telling people, don't tell people who I am. Because people will follow him for what he can do for them instead of to know him. They'll follow him for fleshly reasons instead of spiritual reasons. And there's whole sections of the church today who bless that. And so he healed these people, and he had like, I got to get away from y'all. And in Luke 6, 12, it says, at this time, he, he, he went off to the mountain to pray, and he spent the whole night in prayer. This is what he did the entire night. They wanted to make him king. He said, don't tell anybody. And he had to pray the entire night. And, and as, as we... As, as we begin to move into what God has for us, I need you to hear this. Jesus was operating in some stuff, but he knew there was more. And as we begin to move into what God, as a house, as a church, as we are kind of pushing the envelope here recently, and I believe this is the direction we're going to continue to go in. This is, this, this is where we're going. And, and not for nothing, we're starting to see some opposition. We're, we're starting to see some opposition um, like the city now is, wants to have a meeting with us like about our zoning. We've been trying to get our zoning right for over a year. Uh, I need you to keep this in prayer for the next two weeks because we just believe that God is going to give us victory. Amen? Yeah. Amen? Yeah. Now, now, amen. Now, l- l- let me say this. We're not like breaking the law and then praying that God will let us, right? Like that's, n- that's not our prayer. Our, we have been trying to comply with everything we can since before we moved into this place. And we just needed to be finished, finalized, and legal, right? That's, 
We want to be within compliance of every law. We don't, we're, not trying them, we're not trying to get them to rewrite the laws. We're, we're fully trying to comply, and we need them to let it happen, right? So, like, but we're seeing opposition come because of that. And uh, what we need is not, like, to set up, here, here's what we need. We need spiritual revival in this season of wanting more of God. Amen? Like, we don't, we don't need more meetings. We don't need more devotions. We don't, I don't need to tell you what books of the Bible to read. We need spiritual revival. He called the, he went up to the pray, right? He went up to pray on the mountain. He came back down. He's like, okay, now it's on, right? Like I have now told them, I don't follow your rules. Y'all are the ones who are wrong. If anybody's changing, it's going to be y'all, right? And then he went out and he healed them and he's went up to the mountain with God for all night. And he's like, well, I guess this is where it starts, right? This is, this is where it starts. I need some spiritual revival because I'm about to release some things. So he comes down from the mountain he appoints the 12 disciples as apostles at that time, right? And this is the first time in the scriptures we see him calling people to be spiritual disciples, right? The opposition is on. We're going to do our thing. I have prayed. I've heard God. I'm now appointing authorities. And then he comes down. He preaches a sermon on the plain, which is very similar to the Sermon on the Mount. The Sermon on the Mount was kind of a message. You know, he was an itinerant. He went around preaching. So we see on a low place, he preached. He preached this sermon on the plain, and he started telling them things like, blessed are you when you're poor and hungry and sad because you're positioned for revival. This is what he started preaching. He said this in Luke 6, 23, he says, be glad in that day, leap for joy, for behold, your reward is great in heaven. Remember, that is our destination. Great is your reward in heaven, for in the same way, and this is what I want you to catch, for in the same way their fathers used to treat the prophets. Now, I, like this could, you could miss this. Jesus went up, touched God, came down, touched man, and let them know. In the same way they treated the prophets of old, they're going to start treating you. Why? We are going to be connected to God like the prophets of old. This is what he was saying. This was the promise that he came down from the mountain with. Yes, I don't want to let you guys know before, but now it's on, so now I can let the cat out of the bag. Here's where this is going. There isn't going to be a prophet here and a king there. It is about to be a kingdom of priests, and I'm going to release it, and people aren't going to like it, but you're going to keep doing it. And let me let you know, this is what we are going after. As a house, this is what we are going after. Does anybody hear me? This is what we are going after. We have to live, we have to live for a reward in heaven. This is what Jesus promised us. If you keep your eye on that, everything else will be added to you. But if you keep your eye on this one little thing, you might get it, but that's all you got. That's it. That's it. And, and, and let me tell you, and, and I'm, in a, I'm in an age, and some of you are close to my age, you know, like, and I'm having to make conscious decisions. Life has to be more than about paying off my house, getting my kids through college, and having a retirement. It's got to be about more than that. Yeah. I mean, it has got to be about more than that. And I really want that. Okay? Like, like, I, re like I, really, I really want that. But that cannot be what life is about. House paid off, kids through college, retirement. It's got to be about more than that. There has to be a reward in heaven that we are working for. And again, evil is always working against this plan that God has. Yeah. Evil is always working against it. And, and God is more than responding to this flow of evil. He's restoring the, uh, the, the Romans 12 gifts. He's restoring 1 Corinthians 12 gifts. He's restoring the Ephesians 4 offices. Today, we see people come into Christ and, and, and they... And they begin operating in these things almost by accident. Like they just begin seeing visions and prophesying and the fire of God falling and seeing their, their friends and family get touched by the power of God. Like, it's, like there is revival happening in the world today. This is what the church is going into. Now, other people can focus on other things if they want, but this is where the kingdom of God is heading, spiritual revival. And today, God is restoring all this to the church. But let me, let me, let me bring up something from last week. And, and you might remember this. Some, some people were, were just traveling on the road and then bam, right? You remember this? And this, is, this has been your life now. That's it, right there. That's it. Just that's it. That's life now. That is it. No second try. Just leave it there. No second try. 
That's it. Some of you, spiritually, you know what I'm talking about. Like, that's what it has felt like. That's what it has felt like. Then you're like, man, let me tell you this. Jesus came for revival, but religion says our routines are better. When you get stuck, hear me, when you get stuck, you need spiritual revival. When you get stuck, you need a spiritual revival. When you feel like you're stuck in a cycle, when you're stuck in a pattern, when you're not getting where you thought you were supposed to be, what, what, what happens is you don't recognize on the, on the altar of your heart, you don't recognize it's not just heaven anymore. There's a couple other goals that you set up there as well. And your disappointment does not come from you not getting heaven. Your disappointment comes from not getting those goals. And I'm just saying this super, super gently because I've been there. Those are idols. And, and you won't have real joy until you just release them. You will not get real joy until you release them to God. Last week, so many people told me they were like that little kid. Like people just came up to me like, no, that, that, that was me. Like I hit the tree and I've just, I've, I, like that's where I have been for two, three, four, five years. Like this is, I, I feel stuck in this pattern of life in revival is a time of a quickening of the spirit a sensitivity to the leading of the spirit come on mike it, it is a time when god begins to refresh and renew and he helps us like he makes him think him the most valuable thing on our altar and it makes it super easy to just push everything else off the altar of, of our heart other than jesus christ in Him glorified. If I could say it once again, we need spiritual revival. This is what we need individually. I'm talking about in personally. I'm not saying the church. Need, I'm not saying the church. Need, I'm saying I need it. I'm saying you need it. Like the church will take care of itself. Jesus Christ is the Lord of the church. I'm talking about us. We need spiritual revival. And I want to challenge you in this season. Next week is Pentecost Sunday. And I am absolutely not promising you that you're going to get everything you ever wanted next week. Right? Like, I, I'm like I, I, I have written off the big hype train for meetings. I, I've written it off. I've just, you know, there have been way too many conferences that were the turning point of the church that really just turned out to be a good conference. Can, can we be honest? I don't, I don't want to promise you. you got to get with God and figure out what you're going to get next Sunday. You are actually going to have to develop a relationship with Jesus. You're actually going to have to be like Jesus and maybe spend the night in prayer. You might need to actually just wrestle one of those idols off the heart, off the altar of your heart, and, and, and try to maybe clean up Jesus on that idol and see what he might promise you for next week. But I promise you he's going to be here. And I promise you, enough hungry people show up, he's going to do something supernatural in people who weren't even expecting it. Stand with me if you would. In this next week, I, 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 want you, I want you to like lean into revival. I want you to be looking for God. I want you to be looking for the angels. Pray in tongues more. Pray in tongues more. Come to the burning room. It's going to be fire this week. Take a step of faith and share your faith with someone around you. I want to pray for you now. I want to pray for you now. And I want to pray for a hunger in your heart. Let, let me just ask you this right now. How many people in this room are brave enough to admit, yes, my, 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 my focus has drifted slightly off of my reward in heaven to other things. And I need a spiritual revival. Who would say, yeah, you're talking to me this morning, Pastor. I want to pray for you this morning. I want to pray for you that God would begin a fire in your heart that would consume every idol that does not bring Him glory. Let's pray. Father, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. <coughs> Father, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Ha. Fa oh, yeah. Ha. ha. I just release your angels right, right now to begin ministering to the hearts of people. Father, I, I, I release your power right now to begin to begin moving on their behalf. That you would begin to stoke the flames in their heart. That you would begin to stoke the flames of revival in their hearts. That you begin to revive 
the hearts of those under the sound of my voice, Lord. That a hunger would build up on the inside of them for your presence, Jesus. For the reality of your presence in your kingdom. Father, that you would begin to speak to them before they go to bed scripture and they would wake up with a promise spoken by the Holy Spirit. Father, I pray in the name of Jesus that every false God will be wiped from their lives. That every bit of oppression, they will be delivered from it, Lord. And that there will be open heavens above them. Father, there will be open heavens. Open heavens. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. That you would stoke flames right now, Lord. That you would stoke a passion and a hunger, Jesus. Come on, come on, just begin to cry out. Jesus, we need your presence in our lives. We need your presence in our families. Send revival in my life, Jesus. Come on, lift your voice. Send revival in my life, Jesus. Touch my family. Touch my heart. Touch my church. Come on, come on, come on, come on. Let a spirit of hunger. Father, grant them the gift of hunger for more of you. Hunger for more of you. Hungering and thirsting after righteousness. Sheba kan terebe. I declare the fire of God over your life. The fire of God over your life. The fire of God over your life. In Jesus' name. And all God's people said, can you lift your voice and lift the clap offering to the Lord? Amen, amen, amen. Come on, give it up for the word this morning. Thank you, Pastor Carl. How you guys feeling? I got one question, then I'm going to dismiss you. You guys ready to change the world? Come on, he wants to do it through you. He wants to do it through you. He wants to do it through you. Tell your neighbor he wants to use you. He wants to do it through you. Jesus, we are hungry and we need a spiritual revival. And I just pray that you would come and consume your people today and throughout the week. And everybody said, amen, amen, amen. Come on, give it up one more time for Jesus. God bless you guys. Thank you for coming and joining us today. We will see you next week. And don't forget, join us for Burning Room on Friday night, 730. We'll see you there. God bless you guys.